7 through 13, as we talk about the importance of love. And while you're turning there, let me set the table. Our world is turning very ugly in its demeanor, deportment, and behavior. I mean, the, the stores are ugly, how people treat each other, ugly. Uh, total strangers will walk up to people and just get into their business and say ugly things to them. You have ugly stuff going on at the job. Uh, backstabbing, uh, cutthroat, uh, me first, ugly stuff. And in politics, it's show sure enough ugly. Uh, there's, there's, no, there's nothing about let's just see what we can do to fix the problem. It's all about uh, fixing the blame. It's not what can we do to get it together. It is, I'm going to, you know, the, the problem is in a, in a society such as ours is if you're in a boat together and I stand up and blow a hole in the end of your boat and said, there, fix you, didn't I? But if you're in the same boat, <laughs> kind of don't make sense. Now, ugly in the world, we cannot fix that. But there is an answer. Ugly in the church, that's a different ball game altogether. That's a whole nother puppy. Because God does not allow us to be so unloving and unkind to each other, whether we in the building or away from the building, and that is also not just in the church, but the homes that those churches reflect. Whole lot of ugly in homes. Lack of love. Lack of love. 1 John 4 says it this way. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Meaning, this ought to be a byproduct of your relationship with God. If you know God, this is something that should flow from that relationship. In verse 8, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is loved, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the perpetuation for our sins. Be loved if God so loved us. If God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. For no man have seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. In verse 13, hereby we know that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And here the idea, church, is the capacity to do what he tells us to do is present if the Holy Spirit resides in you. You see, a Christian has no reason and no excuse for being unloving. Now, I'm not talking about just in word. We're going to get to the practice of it. But here you're talking about something that God says do. Now, 1 John, textually, is a book that talks about ways in which you ought to look at things to test your faith. And then if you flunk the test, it might be you don't have faith. Bottom line. If you don't do righteous, you need to find out if you know the one that is righteous because the one who does righteous is born of God. It's a test. It's the idea of a person who confesses Jesus Christ is coming to flesh. That's a test. But to be in church and be around religion and be in some denomination, some title, some handle, some position in some office and deny that Jesus Christ comes in the flesh is a test. There's something wrong there. It's a test. And one of the other tests is a life of holiness. That because he's holy, we should be holy. 
That's testing us. But here he talks about the idea that seeing the love of God in you demonstrates a relationship with him. Seeing the lack of the love of God in you demonstrates maybe an unawareness of who he is. Meaning that outwardly, your demonstration of love is a evidence of who lives in you. Outwardly, the lack of that demonstration is an evidence of who may not be in you. Now again, it's impossible to claim that you love God whom you've not seen. Oh, I love Jesus. But then to hate the people that you do see. So we're going to talk about this issue of love. The love is a bedrock, unmovable. There's no negotiation. This is not, this is for some, but not for me. This is for everybody. It's a law. Look over in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 13. John 13. And notice, if you would, verse 34. Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you. Now watch the command, not the suggestion, church. It is not, do I feel like this on Monday but not on Tuesday? This is, this is not a suggestion, it's a command. A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another. As I have loved you that you also love one another. Now the idea of new means this was not required in the Old Testament. And the truth of it is if you look at Leviticus, one of the principles in the Old Testament is that you ought to love everybody. But it is new in the sphere and the capacity to love because something different about the old is God could command it, but the people lacked internally the power to do it. In the New Testament, God still commands the same love. In the Old Testament, it showed us how bad we failed. In the New Testament, we are equipped meaning that he gives to us internally the Holy Spirit, which makes it possible for you and I to keep this commandment. I can't love that person. Nope, you can't get off the hook like that because God won't let you because now he's given us equipment. Let me show you how much this stretches us beyond what we're comfortable with because he not only demands a love for our wives and our children, and our spouses, and our family members, he, he throws a net that says, I even want you to love your enemy. Oof. Don't make me fish in that fishing hole, Lord. But because of the one who's in you, that is not a suggestion to you. That has nothing to do with how you feel. This is a commandment that he makes to us, and he means what it says. Now, there are some commandments, some laws that we break because we don't know they exist. Normally, when you're driving down the road and you get pulled over, normal rule of thumb is, I didn't see that sign. I didn't know the speed limit was this sign. But when it comes to the commandment of love, God has written it everywhere. It's all in the book. From Genesis to Revelation, it's written everywhere. And matter of fact, it's not only written everywhere, he demonstrates himself, you ought to do this because this is the essence of who I am. God is love. So you have no excuse. And so he writes it. Now there are some laws that are on the books that are unenforced. It's amazing, uh, several states have laws, I was reading a couple of the states that still have books that are unenforced. God is going to enforce this law. 
He wasn't wasting pencil, pink, ink, or paper. This is a commandment. Also, it is a law that does not dismiss you because of your age or your education, your possessions, or your experiences, or even language. One of the things I loved about Liberia so much, and Pastor Dale and I can say this, I fell in love with Pastor Sigbe before I met him. And we stood and oftentimes would just look at each other. Sometimes we even hold hands. And I couldn't help but reach over periodically just to grab him because I already had an affection for him. It's there. And you know what? Language and cultures don't mess with love. Which is why I have a hard time seeing people go off in stores when somebody's speaking another language and they go off on them. Don't talk, to, don't talk around me like that. Are you that insecure? Fact of the business, I'm going to tell you the truth. If people want to say something bad to you, they're going to say it where you can understand it. They're not going to cloak it. I want you to know what I think about you so you know where it is. But when people, you get in the elevator, I wonder if they're talking about me. Don't be that insecure. They might be talking about how handsome or good looking or pretty you are, and you sitting there getting mad. I wonder if they're talking about me. Wrong reasons. Language, culture, different sides of the track where people come from, there are no boundaries. No boundaries here of what love is supposed to cover. God did not rescind the law of love. He hasn't altered it, modified, abrogated, nullified, nor has he improved on it. We still are in need today, and we will always be in need of being controlled, moved, and knowing how to deal with each other in Christian love. And if the world lasts another 2,000 years, the necessity of love will not go away because love is eternal. First Corinthians teaches me faith will go away. Hope will go away. Charity is not going anywhere because it has an eternal merit. It has an eternal value in itself. So it's never been rescinded. It is correct when they wrote this, it's correct today. I hear people say, but that's kind of, we just need to love everybody. Well, if you're only using love in a soupy, soft kind of way of rhetoric, that might be true, that it's worthless. But as an underlying principle of God that is fixed on the word of God, it demands something of us. It speaks directly to me, Dwight Scott, you have no excuse for not loving people. Now, get me now. Heard this. I love people, but I don't like people. You got to explain that to me. How does that look? Because you have to engage people. And what love does, love will be able to help you like people if you got it right. Number one, scripture says charity will do something. It'll cover something. I was trying to come up with all kind of illustrations these last few days, and the only one I could come up with was porcupines. There's a whole family of them. You said, but how do you hug a porcupine? Ask a, ask a boy porcupine and a girl porcupine how y'all get along. They do. Because you get baby porcupines. <laughs> Somehow they have worked it out with all them needles and spikes and things they got on them. They've learned how to love each other. <laughs> now if God can work it out with a porcupine, Surely, 
He can work it out with us. Oh, the wisdom of God with a porcupine. Now watch this now. You and I have to be able to work this out. Now watch this. On the principle of love, it, it is promoted all through scriptures. You know, you can tell how something is important by not only who says it, God, but by how others come along and promote what is said. This next week, this between here and Sunday, there will not be a day go by that you won't hear somebody say something about the Chiefs. Not a day. It'll be from you and others, but you're not going to hear. You're going to walk in a grocery store, and a total stranger you don't know will mention something to you. How about them cheese? You're going to have people texting you, emailing you. you. You got it going on already? Now, we got, we got a few more days of suspense because this is a buildup. But watch this now. What are people c communicating the subject about? In other words, this thing is building. And I hope Bannister Old Baptist Church, we can start communicating something. Now, take the time. I, I want to hear something about the Chiefs between here and there. But then that day is going to come and go. This morning, as you walked around and greeted each other, did you whisper somebody's ear, I love you? You see, this is where we get to talk about that love, and we should. And so we need to promote it. I'm, I'm going to be promoting the love of, love, of, love of God. Not only the love of God for me, there should be a promotion the, of my love of God for him, but there's also the love of God that we should have for each other. Okay? So Romans 12, it is promoted. Romans 12, look at these scriptures quickly. Notice in verse 10, be kindly affected. Thank you, grandson. Be kind. One to another. With what kind of love? Fraternal love. That, that person's in my fraternity, sorority. That's my sister, my brother. In honor, preferring one another. So he's pushing the idea that we need to be kindly affection. And I don't mind the word affection because if, 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 if I tell my wife I love her, she's listening to more than just the words. She won't, look, mm, she won't feel something. So do I. As a matter of fact, you can verbalize the words, but then the affection that should go with it may not be felt. And I hear you. You say, you don't feel love. I'm sorry. I think love has an effect upon us. That's why you got married, wasn't it? Because you had a bunch of ooey gooey's going on inside of you at the time. Somebody asked an old woman one time, they were crying and said, <gasps> Mama, it wasn't a mama, that's what she, she said, I think I'm in love, I'm in love. Well, how do you know? I can't eat, I can't sleep. This was Mom Mabel. <laughs> Mom said, baby, that's not love, you just got indigestion, that's all it is. <laughs> you know, love will make you do some stupid things, you know that? When you're in love with someone and you, you're not yet married to them, so you're in love with them before you marry them, but boy, it'll make you do some stupid stuff. You write 15, 16, 17 page letters and put all kind of hearts and, and, and LOLs and everything else on them. You, you, <laughs> let me, let me, let me, what's the LOL? I don't know, lots of love. That's the wrong thing? Okay. I don't know. I thought it was lots of love. That's not what it means? I didn't know the language. I'm sorry. That's, that's a foreign language to me. I thought it meant lots of love. That's not what it means? Don't tell me now. Wait till after church, okay? <laughs> Woo! 
Boy, ignorance is bliss, isn't it? I'm telling you. I thought that's what, that's not what that means? Seriously? Well, tell me later. Don't, don't just, LOL means lots of love. That's my language. That's how I interpret it, amen? That's how I've always, I, I show my ignorance. I recall standing at a phone booth on the, uh, term, uh, the, uh, at the terminal in Bermuda, and uh, in, in, in the, the island of Bermuda, with a bag of quarters, I had gone to the bank and turned about $45, $50 into quarters, because didn't have cell phones back then. And so I stood at that phone booth and dropped quarter after quarter after quarter so I could talk to this lady. Quarters, and then when I ran out, I wanted to go get some more quarters. But the little exchange was closed. Why? What love make you do some silly things? But they're good. There's affections, and they're real. Notice, if you would, in Romans 13 and 8. For those of you who said that I'm not in debt, I don't know nobody. Yes, you are. And you're going to forever be in debt. Someone said my house paid off, my car paid off, uh, my boat paid off. I don't care, you still got debt. You say, how can I be in debt when I paid everybody I owe? Look at Romans 13. Look at verse 8. Owe no man anything. But what? For he that, have, he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. You're going to always be indebted. There's no such thing as I paid my debt. And I'm going to tell you what love does. Love will never say, these are my boundaries of who I will let into my circles of love. Love is always looking to expand itself. Love has open arms. My mother, bless her heart, was the kind of mom that unfortunately some of our neighborhood uh, ch uh, friends didn't have, either the boys or the girl. So when tragedies happen, I cannot tell you how many times the doorbell rang or there was a knock on the door, and one night there wasn't even a knock or door a bell ring, a neighbor just came and opened the door opened my mom and daddy's bedroom while they were in the bed, looked at my mama because her daddy had just died, and my mom saw that look on her face and knew something was up, and she was crying, my daddy died. And mom's on, what does love do? It opens itself. It doesn't say, you not my child. It opens itself. In the church, we're going to have to be that group that opens itself. You can't have anybody walk in here that you make them feel strange. You cannot have anybody walk in this door as to say we've already got all we need to extend love to. You cannot say I've reached my max. It extends itself. By the way, it extends itself to people who don't come right the first time. We heard a man encourage us yesterday to come down to City Union Mission. And he said, come down there and disciple and do that. And I heard him, I've been down there before, to minister, take food, feed, and I knew he was right. He said, now, they look stinky sometimes, they don't smell right. But love has to extend. It has to get why, it has to, what's the word I wanna make, say? I'm glad that when God loved us, he made room for everybody to come. He did a whosoever will type thing is what I'm saying. Look, if you would, in 1 Peter, chapter 1 and verse 22. Brother Nate, do I need to let this down a little bit? There you go. 1 Peter, chapter 1 and 22. And I don't need to rush. I just want you to see this principle and commandment of God is supported and held up by, by the writers of the New Testament for the churches and the saints today. 
In 1 Peter chapter 1, and in verse 22, what does it say? Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. Watch this. What are you supposed to show? Unto unfeigned. What's the word unfeigned mean? What does that mean? Anybody know what unfeigned means? Don't be faking it. I'd rather you tell me you don't like me and mean it than to tell me you love me and you're lying. <laughs> just be real. <laughs> okay, just tell me. At least I know, the, know what a playing field is. But don't tell somebody you love them and you don't. Either by heart condition or how you deal with them. He says you ought to, you, you ought to do this with unfeigned love unto the brethren seeing that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Now here's the one thing about loving people. But if you love people fervently, that makes you vulnerable. People that you love can hurt you. Well, that's the risk of love. When you got married, I, I, you know, I, I love then, I love now, but I knew that when I gave my heart to Sister Scott, she could crush it. She could absolutely destroy me because I was giving heart. But watch this. You can't love somebody by giving them a piece, a part, or a lack of totality. For me, all in or all out. But it cannot be yes to love and no to love at the same time. That's not only true of a spouse, children. You know, some people don't love their children and they just see them as a burden. And you know what? Your kids will pick up on that. <laughs> They'll get that. And, and, and love will make you do, it, it'll, it'll, now children going to tax you. Sometimes you want to kill them, you love them, but you just want to kill them that day, raise them the next day is what you want to do. <laughs> okay. But you do love them. Watch this. And you love them even when they do stuff to crush you. As a matter of fact, oftentimes you love them more because you, you have to extend to them more grace and forgiveness than probably you, you thought you'd have to. Stay with me, church. In 1 Peter 5.14, Peter says, Greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with all of you that are in Christ Jesus. And I, that means, hey, listen, you're to demonstrate that. Now, brothers, let me be square up with you. Let's, let's get this thing off the table right away. We don't live in the culture that they lived in. So don't walk up try and put your lips on me, because I ain't going to do it to you. <laughs> But there are some cultures still today where that is very appropriate. I'm glad America got delivered from that culture. But you see some cultures, they'll walk up and they'll put a, the man will put one. And now ladies, y'all can do some things we can't do. Y'all will kiss on each other's cheeks. And in our holiness church, they kissed each other on the lips, the ladies did. What's nothing weird about it, it's just the way they kiss. Now brothers, it's all right. We good. That's, 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 you, you're demonstrating love by just, but hold it right there. Okay, hold it right there. But if we were in the culture, I would try to adapt. When I was in Africa, in the Tanzania, when they really like you, they hold your hand, the men, and they walk with you. And the first time this man grabbed my hand, this Tanzanian brother, uh, the, the missionary didn't explain that to me. So I eased my fingers out of there. Cause it, you know, it was beyond two minutes. <laughs> and guess what? He reached over and grabbed it again. And, and the missionary told me, he says, I envy you. He says, this guy hadn't done that with me. That means he really cares for you. I said, this is what this means? So I had to get used to it for those few weeks we was there. So I just held on as long as I could. 
but I made it back to America, amen? <laughs> but you are okay demonstrating love in an appropriate way for the culture that you're in. James put it this way. He said, if you fulfill the royal law, James 2, 8, according to the scriptures, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. He extends it beyond just people who are look like you. He says, even your neighbor, people who are around you that are not particularly family members, do ye. We had a Muslim couple moved in across the street. And so we tried to be neighborly and we would go, I, I like to fish, so I would take fish over to them. And I, would, I thought that over time, you know, you couldn't walk in and just start talking scripture to them. Sometimes you have to become friends. And so we would do that. Now he married, and the lady he married, she spoke no English. And so when he brought her home from where he married her, her and my wife would walk. She would be pregnant, she got pregnant, and they would walk and her, his wife would practice her English on Geneva, trying to understand how to say it, concepts, things she'd heard and if she understood it right. We worked through that. We, we would, they would come over and when we went to their home, watch this, as soon as we hit their doors, shoes went off. Their culture. When they came to our home, they did the same. They had some things they would eat, and so we knew it. So when they came to our home, there would, we didn't do no pork chops and bacon. We would share with them what we knew they ate. Now you can just say, I'm gonna cook what I want, you eat what I put there, you go home. But that's not showing yourself to be a good neighbor. So it's called fulfilling the royal law. It's the idea that God wants you to treat people like you would want people to treat, treat you. We had a lady running here, she was a Muslim lady, and she had her uh, covering on, and she'd had a run out of gas and the car wouldn't start, and so she came in, she didn't know anybody. She says, may I use your phone? She was nervous, I said, sure. Um, she got on the phone and they, she was trying to tell, she says, I'm in this Baptist church. <laughs> And I said, well, can I help you? And we went and got gas and tried to get her started, treated her nice, never seen her again, but you don't have to know people to be neighborly. There is a royal law. The law is do to others what you'd want them to do, do to you. Now for the sake of time, practice. This is where I really want to land. If you look at the practice, I want to ask you, what do you think love should look like? There are some behavior things about love. In other words, more than the words, I love you, what does it really, how does it behave and what does it look like? And if you want to know, look in Galatians chapter 5. Here are some things that love should not do. Don't tell me you love me and you hitting on me. I don't want to hear that. Don't tell me you love me and you cussing me out. I don't want to hear that. That's... You know, guys tell their wife, uh, you, I love you, that's why I treat you like I, I want to hear that. That's a stupid love. In Galatians chapter 5, here are some things love won't do. Are you with me in verse 13? What does it say? I hear you murmuring. You've not been called, you've been called to liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but watch this, by love, what? For all the laws fulfilled in this one word, in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thy what? Now what's the way you demonstrate that? Verse 15, you can't be loving people if you biting and devouring and chewing them up all the time. You, you know, you, you have to learn that you can't devour people with words. And here's what'll happen, when a person enters into your life, my life, your world, my world, this church, you know nothing about them, they're blank. But as you begin to know them and they begin to know you, 
you see flaws, you see weaknesses, you see imperfections. And then that is where, if we're not wise, we get, begin to bite and devour, especially in an unbiblical way. And pretty soon, that person that was once whole doesn't have totality because you've chewed them all to pieces. There's nothing left. So you have to be careful. Uh, how do you deal with people's imperfections and flaws? And I'm going to be honest with you. Is there anybody walked in this door that was perfect? Is there anybody in your home that's perfect? I know you look at the mirror and you say, he's the problem, she's the problem, and I'm right. But I guarantee you, in that home, in this church, and anywhere in the world, anywhere you have two people, you got two flawed, imperfect people with a fallen, sinful, carnal nature. Always. And so what you can't do is start biting. Well, I don't like the way they look Tuesday. I don't like the way they look on Wednesday. Well, you're not going to change your mind when Saturday come along if you've been chewing them up like that all week long. That's why you need charity, because charity will cover a multitude of sin. Now, role play with me. What does it look like? Your spouse has been working all day long, or your dad, or your mom, or your sister, brother, and they've been in traffic, they just got a ticket, they just been treated bad, and they walk in the day and they walk in the door, and they're not on their best, and they don't treat you right. And what you do is you get your book out, and you mark and say, okay, 2.30, Monday, acted ugly. <laughs> well, you know, that thing can repeat itself, and then all of a sudden, you got a book full of check marks of stupid, dumb, irresponsible, callous things that that person has done. Now, what if God start keeping a book on you? <laughs> what if he took the book and said, well, let me show you what you look like? That's why you need to get into the mirror of the word of God, because it's reflective. What if God said, you know, I looked in your heart, because, you know, you can be ugly if you're all by yourself. You know, you can't, you can't use the excuse, this person made me ugly. You can be ugly in your personality by yourself. So when he shows you the mirror in the word of God, oftentimes it's not them, Lord, it's me. Okay. So you got to be careful. Don't bite and devour. Look, if you would, in verse 26, same book. Let us not be desirous of what? Provoking one another, envying one another. Vainglory means empty, doesn't mean a thing. I repeat, in a, in a debate or argument, if you don't both win, neither one of you win. It just works that way. It's mean, you're in the same car, church, we're in the same car, and there's no such thing as I'm better than you, you, you know, I'm on top. It doesn't work that way. It's vain. I, I know something you don't know. My mother and father, dead, third grade education. Mom, she didn't finish high school as a child. She had to stop in the eighth grade. She did go back when she was in her 40s or 50s because she always wanted to be, a, got a GED. They let her teach school for a little bit with GED, but mama came home and said, uh-uh. So <laughs> she said, no, no. She said, I'm gonna take care of my kids at home. Now watch this. But although her children have excelled, most of us in education, ask me how we feel towards our parents as if our education affected how we felt. Not at all. That's why vain glories, things that you're desirous of, it should not lift you, swell you up, things of that nature. Then, Galatians 6, 1, if you have somebody that fall, here's what love looks like. It doesn't just talk about, there they go, and I knew it was going to happen. Love goes after people. Oh, for a love that will not let me go. So you, when you care for people, you go after them. By the way, church, sometimes you say, well, what happened to so-and-so? If you ask the question, it's because you've not sought their good. Because if they came across your mind, 
if they were in your thoughts, that was maybe a prompting for you to call and check on them. It was probably a call for you to say, you brought them on my mind. Don't ask the question. Seek them out. We've been missing a brother who, who sings in the choir the last few weeks. And I made sure I had his phone number right. I said, listen, I called you and your, your, your phone didn't ring right. And when, when, he, when he told me this morning, he said, that's an old number I don't even remember. And I don't even know how I got that. But what I was after was calling. When people are not present or they're strayed, he didn't fall, he'd been sick. Boy, that was encouraging. Not that he was sick, but he had a reason for being away. So you check, this is what you do. This is what love looks like. Do you know how it feels when somebody checks on you? Doesn't that give you a warm ooey gooey? Even when you know you ought not to have been away, <laughs> you know, at least somebody's thinking about you. Look, if you would, also in Galatians chapter uh, 6, uh, verses, uh, uh, verses 2. Bear ye one another's burdens. Help them to carry their load. Now, I love you sounds good. But helping people when they get under a load is very, very practical. Now, don't tell me you're going to just pray for me. You know, we, you need to do something. For example, now the burden here is we all have our own backpack. We know that. But there are times things happen that puts a heavier weight than what one person can bear. And this is where we need to be sensitive in love. Love doesn't just say Sunday morning, I love you. Everything that happens to you after Sunday, you just got to deal with it. I'm trying to go somewhere with this. Here's why I want to push this. We are a hospital, spiritually, that's designed to help people when they get sick, get well. But don't re remember now, the hospital is for people who are well that may one day be sick. While we may be well, we're supposed to help people. Now, this is what love is supposed to do. Bear the burden. And then also in Galatians verse 3, if a, if a man think himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceive himself. When you're loving right, you have a right estimation and an esteem of your value. Never let your education think that you're above people that you're talking to. And never let what's in your checkbook, no matter how much money you have, make you think that you're superior to anyone else. I want to remind you, the demonstration is, he that said hi came down here. He that was the ancient of days and wise beyond all measure took time to sit with us and teach us and talk to us and love us. So should we do that one to another. Now, 1 John, and I want to close. Go back to chapter, 1 John chapter 2. A few verses. Here's how love should not behave in John. Galatians says this is what love should do. Here's what love should not do. How does love Respond, here it is. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 8 through 11, he says, Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past, meaning you've been saved, and the true light, the truth of the gospel present in you is shining. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness, even unto now. He that loveth his brother. So when I hear people talking about they hate this people, that people, that's telling me something about their salvation. Because that darkness should have been gone when you got saved. You should have stopped hating people. If you ever hated them, you should have gotten rid of that when you came to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. 
no, no offense about it. I don't care who it is. If, even if it's somebody who did something wrong to you, something very vile to you, the moment you come to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you leave the darkness of hate so you can live in the light of love. It just has to be that way. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. And there's no stumbling. Look at chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. In this is manifested children of God and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness and love is a righteous thing is not of God. Neither is he that loveth not his brother. And then he says, now, if you are hateful and have a hateful spirit towards anything or anyone, that's an indication you're connected with an evil presence. So a lot of the hatred that we're sensing in the streets, you have to understand that doesn't come from God. And we have to identify it for what it is. Okay, that's, that's of someone who is of the evil one. Look at 1 John 3, verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word. This is the practice. Neither just say it in tongue, but what? It's demonstrative how you show that love. I, I'm, I can't say one thing to you on Sunday and then treat you a whole nother way when church is over. It's, it's demonstrative. It shows itself. Uh, you got to be willing to help. You got to will be willing to show love. Brother Dale busted me over in Liberia. I didn't intend for you to know that, but I bought a watch for Pastor Sigbay. I bought a brand new watch. Now stay with me. And I had the watch in a box on top of my dresser. And I forgot to take it when I went to Africa. And I was kill it, kicking myself, but just before the plane took off, I took the one I had on and gave it to him. Ah, uh, don't, don't get me twisted. It wasn't no, it wasn't no Rolex. <laughs> but you know, I don't wear that stuff. But the point is, we can't just use words. Now, I didn't tell him. I didn't tell Ron. I didn't tell my son. But here's what happened. Uh, Brother Dale came to me and said, Pastor Sigbay was doing this looking up. He said, Pastor, you did something. You see, your, your love for people should cause them to look up to the God that creates the love in us. It's designed to, to say what's in you, and you know it's not you. I couldn't do that. Not Dwight Scott. I'm too selfish. So are you. But you're showing God can do a great thing in us. Our problem is the world don't love each other like it's supposed to. And it can't do it without the Lord. Right. Cannot do it. In 1 John 3, 22 through 23, uh, here's the close. I said 1 John, 1 John chapter 4. Let me just skip to the other. It says in verse 10, here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. That's the capacity for loving, is that we see it and we're recipients, recipient, recipients of that great love for us. He loved us. He gave his son to be a propitiation for us. And I am still to this day overwhelmed by the fact that I have a God who made all the world, the universe, and everything in it, but he has a unique place just for me. He has time for me. You know, my mother and father, 12 children, and I've told you this, and I, I joke about it, but I used to tell my mama, mama, you wasted your time having all them kids. You could have just had me and been through with it. <laughs> that was just a waste of time. All them, all them other children could have just had me. But my mama had a unique way of making each of her 12 children believe they were the special child. Guess what? God doesn't have to fake that with you and me. Every one of us has a special place in the heart of God. When you pray, as vast as this world is, 
and as many people in it, God does not listen to our prayers in a group. He hears your individual voice. Watch this. And he numbered all the hairs. If you have any, he numbered all the hairs. I didn't mean to throw that out there. Okay, I'll take you. That wasn't spiritual. But he, num he numbered the hair on your eyebrow and your head. But he numbered something. Okay. Now watch this. What is that showing? His individual knowledge, care, and attention to each one of us. And we have that and can't lose that. Uh, Reggie this morning prayed. And thank you, Reggie. I'm going to bust you now, okay? But he says while his daddy was in losing his mind and Alzheimer's and dementia, he would still be singing, Jesus loves me this. He don't know what, he don't know if it's Tuesday. He might not know who his kids are. But you can still say this, Jesus loves me, this I know. Now what he demands of us is that the same love which, by which he loves us, we model this and we put it on display. Verse 12 says, no man has seen God in any time. He said, if you love one another. By the way, in, in John, the love of God, love that God wants for his people to have one for another is the strongest testimony of God to people. Right. He said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, by the love that you have one for another. That's why I hate church mess. It's not that you right or wrong, but it just messes with the testimony of God about God's love. That's why you hate foolishness. It's not... I have to be right or wrong. It's just that whenever there's foolishness going on, it messes with. Here's what it looks like, and I'll close. Your children come in the house. Mom and daddy having a big row. That messes the kids up. Church is visited. Church in a tete-a-tete -tete over which side the piano or the organ is on. That messes people up. Foolishness. What I'm saying is, this principle of love, Bannister Road Baptist Church, is foundational. It's a foundation principle. We have, to, we have to be there. Then we have to practice that foundation. And the question is, how are we practicing that foundation one with another? Can I encourage you? Let's establish relationships that are built on love. More than just hi, hug you on Sunday, Shake your hand on the walk around. Let's establish relationships. Let's build on that. Let's, let's get together like porcupines. <laughs> now we're gonna get on each other's nerve every once in a while. But it's par for the course. That is God teaching us you need to have something in you that's demonstrating who I am by what I put in you that you could not do without me. We couldn't love like this without him being in us. You can't do it. So here's what I want to ask you. Is he in you? Because if he is, then the love of God ought to be shed abroad. That love in you should be shed abroad. Would you bow your heads in prayer? Father, we want to thank you for this time to stand before your people. We ask, O oh Lord, that as we have dealt with the subject of love, that we see it as a foundational principle, even a command. It is put in such clear words, and it is there because we're told this is a requirement, necessary, one with another, because this reflects who you are. God is love. And in this world, Lord, we need more displays of you but we cannot display you properly without having the love of God permeate, control our hearts, thinking, and mind. If we have ought against anybody, love would say, cover it. With the most, cover that with, the, with charity. If we have wronged anybody, love would cause us to go seek forgiveness and restoration. 
And if, Lord, we have blocked people out, then we need to open up our arms and our circles, just like you have been so inclusive to bring each and every one of us with all of our flaws, with everything you know about us, with all of our weaknesses, even our transgressions that we commit, you still embrace us. And now, Lord, we need to learn how to live with each other through that same love. And if we are successful, if we, if we strive for this, then, God, we want people who walk in these doors to sense the love of God amongst us. And as we walk out of these doors, we want to demonstrate the love of God to other people who are not here. Because if they're going to see it, they have to see you in shoe leather. They have to be people who are walking around showing this is who God is. And we want to submit ourselves to be that type of people. We pray that in this invitation, that Lord, you will let the love of God fill our hearts, but as it goes into our hearts, to go out through our bodies and our minds and our words as we deal with and speak to others, starting with our homes, our church, our families, and then into the world. Leading God in this invitation, we pray. Every head bowed and every eye closed.